What, what are some of the memories that pop into your mind first when you come back here of all the success you've had, one of your best tracks? What, what are you thinking of when you roll through the tunnel? It's funny now the way the place drives. Um, I just have a lot of anxiety about turns one and two. And the previous configuration, that was really the most fun that you could have on a mile and a half was turns one and two. Um, so bummed that it's, it's still not there, but it, you know, same for everybody is what it is. Um, but the track, you know, in, in where I've had most of my success and the fact that you could run from line to wall, the bumps were in the worst places possible, but that was great. That, that created mistakes for the, the drivers and a technical challenge for the teams. And I, I thought made it a really, really racy racetrack. Um, so I, I recently rewatched the battle with Kenseth. Um, we suckered Matt to come into or uh, come into the shop and, and relive that. And uh, you guys, I'm not sure if it's out yet, but it'll come out on social and just reliving those moments and just how racy the track was. And of course I came out on top of Matt and love to give him trouble over that. But um, you know, I, I really miss the, that old circuit. Um, it was a lot of fun. All right, we're gonna go right up here to the right. Uh, Tad Hazel, NASCAR.com. Jimmy, kind of piggybacking on that. Regarding your success you've had here in the past, clearly it implies you had at least some level of comfort at this track with the new car. Is all of that out the window, or is there still some level of comfort? No, I, f I found um, last year with the limited races I ran, it, it is really, really different. Um, I, I think the first 80% is, uh, is normal, but maybe 90%, but that last little bit and where you run the car, you know, I spent a, a lifetime running a car off the right rear, and this car, you just cannot do that. From the aero platform, the, uh, the tire, and the, the, I believe the, the sidewall stiffness of the tire, you can't slip and slide this car around like I like to do. And it, it got me in Charlotte the last mile and a half I was on in Charlotte, got out from under me and I crashed. So um, I keep telling myself coming in this weekend that I need to drive it off the right front. I need to drive through the right front and not my typical style of, of driving on or through the right rear tire. So, uh, you know, this track's very treacherous and it's nice to see it widening out. I think last night with the truck race, um, had some reports back to how the second groove was coming in and, and hopefully we're on the right pathway now to, uh, to really start working in the middle of the track and can widen this place out. Um, and just, uh, just go have some fun. I mean, I, I uh, of course want to run as well as I can. Uh, I want to run all the laps and I want to be able to help our company grow and um, really kind of work through this first quarter, first half of the season with our change of Toyota. There's just a lot of new things for us that we're trying to get our arms around and trying to, you know, we've had some speed at times, but consistently having the speed um, is, is a big objective for us right now. And I hope that my participation this weekend helps us take a step in that direction. Uh, Bob Parker's Fox Sports. I'm curious if you, w did you watch any of uh, Kyle's testing, Larson's Indy 500 testing earlier this week and or what type of advice you've given him about that? I don't know. Uh, yeah, it's on. Okay, cool. Um, I didn't watch live, but I've checked in on social media and I uh, saw that he had a good day and uh, I'm certainly excited for him. I didn't talk to him uh, before or after that specific test, but before Phoenix, uh, maybe after Phoenix, I talked to him just checking in to see what he thinks about uh, the car and the experience, and looks like he's off to a good start. And what do you think will be his biggest uh, challenge in doing the double? Uh, double, I, I mean, getting back and forth, the stress and time commitment. I mean, I, uh, I was really surprised how much time is required to get through the month of May, which just a couple weeks of May, it, uh, at the track in Indy itself. Um, thankfully, the NASCAR schedule is much more relaxed, and, and he's, um, I guess he has a week before on racing to deal with as well. Um, yeah, it, I, I think travel and, and being able to spend the time that he'll want to spend in Indy, that's going to be, you know, compromised a little, and then it depends on weather in Indy, and if, uh, if it's dry and he can get all the laps that he intends to, to get, I think that will help him tremendously. If it's wet and he has some conflicts and can't be on track because of a NASCAR schedule, you know, that, that track time starts to shrink. And that's really what it's about is getting reps in the very unique situations that you see in the race. Um, practice, I personally didn't see the um, aero situations and the traffic situations that came about in the race. And that's where I, I wasn't as prepared as I would have liked to have been. All right, we're gonna go back there and then up to Jeff Buck. <coughs> yeah, uh, James Harris, Toyota's Raceway back here. Uh, Jimmy, 
it, the, the sport's changed uh, quite a bit since you uh, stopped racing full time. Um, you know, the, the playoff system now that we have maybe geared a little bit towards stopping somebody like yourself from dominating for so long, trying to strike a competitive balance in the sport, kind of like F1 is sort of going through the same thing with the competitive balance. Has that been good for the, the health of the sport from your perspective as to how they've changed things since you were on that dominant run that you had? It'd be hard for me not to say that the way I won the majority of my championships is the best way. Um, you know, statistically, there's a lot of evidence that supports the changes we've made and, and where it is. The generation I think anyone grows up in is the generation that they, they love the most. And I, I think our fan base, um, you know, we're always trying to find new fans, but I, I think in time we'll, we'll know the true opinion of the new fans that we're gathering and, and what they think of it. So I think what we live and experience right now is the older generation and their opinion and then balancing that against statistics. Um, so I don't know if I have a great answer. I, I kind of prefer, um, I'd say I, I preferred the playoffs where the 10 races, the points still totaled up to a champion. I felt that was a good representation of both. That's not the world that we're in now, but um, I, I personally like that variation the most. Eric Sarita, Game Day Productions. So you're driving a Toyota now. How does it feel? What are your impressions about it? I don't have a lot of time behind the wheel, but I've really enjoyed the relationship with everyone from TRD and Toyota North America. Um, they race in a different way. They, they have very meaningful relationships, and, and I'd call them part, you know, the true definition of a partnership. So I've, uh, I've enjoyed really the last two years of getting to know them and the last, um, I don't know, six or seven months of really working hand in hand with them uh, since the end of last season. And uh, I think we have a, a very long and bright future together. I'm very excited to work with them. Sure. So back to Larson for a second. Is there any way to describe to people the difficulty level of what he's trying to do in, in going to win that race? I mean, you've, you've obviously been on both sides of that. Um, most, most people haven't. Can, can you describe that? Yeah, I, and I can only speak from the experience that I had. Um, practice, qualifying, you, know, you can get your arms around that and safely find the edge. But when it comes race time, and you're dealing with guys that drive those cars day in and day out and know how to just dance on that edge. Um, it's tough, and, and the cars are at a much bigger arrow disadvantage deeper in traffic. Um, unfortunately, we lost some track position trying to short pit and trying to gain track position in the race, and uh, we never got it back, and I ran back in the 20s, and you just, you just can't go anywhere from back there. So um, if they're able to maintain track position and keep him up front, um, I, I think he'll have a, a, a really good day, and I think Kurt's experience, you know, really showed that. If you can keep clean air on the car, um, I think it it helps the lack of experience that a stock car driver would have going in. Because um, thankfully, you do get a fair amount of laps with the open test session and the way the two weeks unfold. Um, you do get a lot of laps, and in that environment with some air on the car, um, you can get a sense for it. But come race day, I mean, you don't want to put it in the fence. And oh by, the wall, oh, by the, oh, by the way, that wall hurts in an indie car. I mean, it, there really are consequences for your uh, mistakes made in an indie car. We're going to go to Jerry and then Steven. Jerry Jordan, kicking the tires that net. Um, Jimmy, as a team owner and a driver as well, in the negotiations going on with NASCAR, it seems, uh, in speaking with some of the drivers, they have a few different issues that they're, they're talking to NASCAR about than, than maybe the, the team owners are. Your thoughts on what... Uh, any of the, those negotiations are like, and, and you know, from from both perspectives for uh, uh, for drivers and owners. Yeah, it's been a long road, and I still think there's plenty of road left um, for all sides. And if it's drivers negotiating what they would like to see, team owners, and then certainly on NASCAR's side, and in, in what they're um, what they want to see for the future of the sport. And uh, I think it's going to come down to deep in the year when uh, you know everybody has to. Um, and right now, it's still posturing. I, I know we feel like the clock is ticking, but if you look at how much time is left, um, we're just getting into the probably eighth inning, maybe ninth inning of, uh, of what really needs to happen in negotiations for all parties. Is it as much a money thing or maybe an insurance thing or a, or a competition thing? Where, where are some of those areas that you, you think might be hang-ups? Um, drivers probably have a different 
lens they're looking through than the owners. Um, but to still a, a Mr. Hendrick line, um, it's not about the money until it's about the money. <laughs> and so ultimately, uh, you know, there are protections I think that team owners are looking for for longevity that absolutely shore things up for them financially. Um, sure, there's discussions around um, monies that come on the front side through the, the TV um, partnership that, that are important. Um, you know, it's, it's been interesting to watch. You know, I, this is my first time really in this world as a team owner, and I've done a lot more listening than I have, have talking and, and letting the pros really do their job. But what's ultimately been the most impressive to me is just how the team ownership group has stuck together. And I, I think we're a lot stronger as a unified group. Um, carrying a consistent message. And, and that's something that's been more difficult for owners in the past. But um, the ownership group's been very committed to that, and I, I think that's been very useful. Steven? Uh, Steven Stum, com. Uh, right here. Oh, sorry. <laughs> You're good. Uh, Jimmy, it wasn't really till COVID that we kind of began this, you know, process of kind of truncated practice sessions, smaller ones, maybe one instead of two. It was you kind of, you, for all your career until 2020, you, you had the you know the experiences of doing multiple practices per weekend usually given you know how different this new car is um is is kind of having those larger practice sessions something you wish that could return yeah without a doubt i mean the practices are not long enough to make a meaningful change to the car um you know, it's tough to develop and and i certainly understand and appreciate the effort for for cost savings um we're not going to sit still, you know, now we've put so much um, reliance on our um, simulation. And what's tricky with simulation is trying to feed the pipeline of data and the pipeline of information so that your simulation works correctly and crosses over the real world. And then the simulator that you drive um, crosses over the real world. And you know, it's just really tough with um, how little track time there is for all teams to benefit that. Because as you unload, that, that's what you have. And so um, the bigger teams um, with more resources and uh, you know, really resources far and wide to unload on is, is where it's at. And it, and it affects the smaller teams um, that are trying to, that don't have the access that they need, that are trying to feed their pipeline and make good decisions. Um, it, it just continues to make that a, a more challenging dynamic. Uh, and then you think of new teams, new drivers. You know, there's just a lot of layers there that I think more track time would benefit. And it doesn't need to be like it once was where you have four hours of track time, but um, uh, double the track time that we have now, if it was 40 minutes, 45 minutes, um, I, I think you could you know, really help the, the field in its entirety um, be more efficient with their spending. Um, because right now it's, Man, you're just throwing darts, hoping you're spending in the right way and different things. And then after running four races with Legacy so, so far, you're going to begin a, you're going to begin having four races in the next six weeks. In terms of learning this car, you know how important is it to be, you know, not do, doing this many races, but also having them relatively in a quick time span to kind of get familiar with it. Yeah, super helpful. Um, you know, last year I intended to run more events, and. Um, you know, the unfortunate tragedy that our family experienced, it, it put the brakes on that as, as it should have. Uh, but to come back this year, um, you know, again, on last year's agenda, it was much more road course focused, trying to help our program be a bit stronger on road courses. Um, we've, we've shifted this year for a variety of reasons to run more mile and a halfs. And you know, the bulk of my schedule is mile and a halfs. And so to have them in close proximity to one another, and then to be able to go back to Kansas twice, you know, I really think it's going to help me um, extract the most that I can out of the car, help me give the best feedback that I can to my organization, and and directionally help us grow. Yep. We're gonna go back up here. Eric Sarita, Game Day. Uh, which up and coming driver do you believe has the brightest future? John Hunter Nemechek. <laughs> <laughs> do you expect anything else? <laughs> no. Uh, in addition to that, um, you know, it's. I haven't watched the support series races as closely um, the last couple of years in IndyCar and sports car racing, but to see the young crop of, of uh, truck drivers last night duking it out was, was impressive, and even the Xfinity field. There's, there's some young talent there and new faces, at least new for me watching, because I've been removed for a few years, and just impressed. It looks like there's some 
really hungry and talented talent um, coming up through the pipeline. We will take our final question here with Jeff. I want to ask you about Dover, obviously. Um, Texas has changed since a lot of your wins, but Dover, same place. I know it's a different car, but what's your level of optimism going there? I ran it in the sim on Thursday, and it drives a lot different. I don't know how accurate that will be in real life, but um, you know, given the opportunity to pick a track to go back to, I was like, this is easy, I'm going to Dover. Um, I love the area, I love the track, and it's certainly hopeful that it leads to a, a competitive performance, but um, I, I'm ex anticipating it's gonna be quite different. And part of my success at Dover was what I was touching on earlier and just driving a really loose race car and, and driving it with my right foot. You can't do that with this car, uh, with the diffuser and the sidewall, the tire and everything that's with it. So uh, I assume I'll have a steep learning curve. We're actually gonna take one final one from Lee up right up here. Lee Spencer, Series 6 of NASCAR Radio and CatchFence.com. Just curious, do you have um, aspirations of expanding legacy to four cars at some point? I would do three first and then four. Four would be <laughs> quite the commitment. Um, we, we don't have any plans to now. That, that is not part of our objective. Um, in time, um, I understand the benefits that come with three cars, four cars, and the scaling that comes with that. So from a business proposition standpoint, yes, I would be open to it, but we're, we're not in that position now. Um, and we, we need to make sure our two and a half cars are running the best that, uh, to the, our abilities, um, that our, paint, you know, our, our cars are full of sponsorship and that all those economic markers are in place before that expansion would happen. Yep. All right, thanks for the time, Jimmy, and good luck this weekend. I appreciate it, and real quick, um, one last thing, we have a, a new partnership that I wanted to uh, bring to everyone's attention and offer you uh, some free Olipop over at the Transporter, so swing on by and enjoy. Thanks. Thank you.